Today we're going to learn about the reproductive plant. Today's outline is about flowering plant reproductive organs, flower morphology and anatomy, functions, and types of fruit. Plant reproductive organs. Reproductive organs in flowers, their stamens, which are the male reproductive organs, and their scarpels, which are the female reproductive organs. So stamen, male, carpels, female. Stamens, male, carpels, female protected by the perianth, which is a combination of sepals and petals. So the perianth is the sepal plus the petals. The function of reproductive organs are pollination, fertilization, and development of the fruit and the seed. So the reproductive organs and flowers for males males have stamens females have carpels and they're protected by the peri perianth which is a combination of sepals and petals and the function of reproductive organs are pollination fertilization and development of fruit and seed This is the morphology of the flower. We have the stigma. Okay. This is the petal. We have the pistil and the carpal. We have petal, petal, stigma. The anther. These are the anthers, the filament is here, and both the anther and the filament make up the stamen. Okay, so this is the stamen, this is the style, the one in the middle, this is the ovary, okay, this is the ovule. Okay, and this is the receptacle. This is the sepal. So if we go up here, so let's see where the stamen is. The stamen is the male reproductive organ. So the stamen. Okay, the stamen is a combination of the anther and the filament. The anther is over here. The filament is over here. And these are the male, this is the male reproductive organ. Okay, the female, females have carpals. Okay. And the reproductive organs are protected by the perianth, which is a combination of sepals and petals. Over here, you see petals. Okay. Petals. Okay. This is the carpal which is the 
female reproductive organ. Okay. And this is the sepal. Okay, both the sepal and the petals make up the perianth. Okay. So, what are the functions of sepals and petals? The sepals function mainly is to protect the flower from buds and insects. The petal, the petal's function is to attract pollinators. So P for petal, P for pollinators. Petal attracts pollinators. The sepal's function is to protect the flower from buds and insects. And how does the flower attract pollination agents such as insects and birds? Well, the use of colors attract insects. The use of ultraviolet marks, which can be seen by insects, and providing a landing platform for visiting insects. So, some ways that a flower attract pollination agents, such as insects and birds, are by the use of their colors to attract insects. Use of UV marks, which can be seen by insects, and they provide a landing platform for visiting insects. So what parts of the flower are important for pollination? So the parts of the flower that are important for pollination are the stamens and the carpels. The stamens have pollen and the carpels have the stigma. So let's see this picture again. Okay, so remember the stamen is the male reproductive organ. The anther and the filament make up the stamen and they're both located here. All of these are stamens together. Okay, and this is where the pollen would be stored. And the carpal And the or the pistil, which is another name for it. This whole section over here is the carpal or pistil, which is the female reproductive organ. Okay. And they contain the stigma, which is over here in the middle. Okay. So the parts of the flower that are important for pollination are the stamens and the carpels. The carpels contain the stigma and the stamens contain the pollen. Okay? So what parts of the flower are involved in fertilization? So the stamens are involved in pollen and they have the pollen tube. The carpels have the style, the stigma, and the ovary. Stamens are, have pollen in the pollen tube. The carpels have style stigma. And an ovary, and remember, so the carpels are part of the female reproductive organ, and the stamens are part of the male reproductive organs, usually. Okay, let's see. Okay. Over here is another diagram. Oh, these are the female reproductive, part of the female reproductive organs. You see the ovules here. Okay. This is um, the pistil. This is the placenta over here. Okay. This is the style, and they took a cross section of this. These are the petals of the flower. Remember, the petals make up the perianth. Okay? This is what a stamen looks like. 
This is the style and this is the stigma. Stigma, stigma, style, style. Stammen. So remember, stamens have pollen, carpels contain the stigma. Okay, the carpels contain the style, the stigma, and the ovary. Okay. The stamens contain the pollen, the pollen tube. Okay, usually the stamens are part of the male reproductive organs and the carpels for female. And then both the sepals and the petals make up the perianth, which serves as a way to protect the flower. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the male reproductive organ. So we're going to talk about the stamen. We have the anther, which has two bags of pollen grains. This is the anther, okay, in yellow, the anther. This is the anther when it's open. This is the filament, okay? This contains the pollen grains. And this whole thing, both the anther and the filament make up the stamen, okay? Which is part, which is the male reproductive organ. So the anther has two bags of pollen grains, okay? And then there's the filament. They both make up the, sta the stamen. Uh, the pollen grain is an immature fail I'm sorry an immature male gametophyte so the pollen grain is an immature male gametophyte a vegetative cell which develops into a pollen tube a generative cell which gives rise to two sperm cells to fertilize ovule structures and this is, okay, a cross-section or a view of pollen under the microscope, okay? Okay, now we're going to talk about the female reproductive organ, okay, the carpal. So... The carpels forming pistil. We have the style, the stigma, and the ovary, which are all part of the carpel. These are this is the female reproductive organ. The style, the stigma, the ovary are all contained in the carpel. The ovules, the female gametophyte embryo sac. This is and uh, the ovules is what it looks like under a microscope. Okay, now we're gonna talk about pollination. Okay, so we have self-pollination, which basically means um, that the pollen is produced in the anthers and is carried to the stigma of the pistil in the same flower. So in self-pollination, the pollen is produced in the anthers and is carried to the stigma of the pistil in the same flower. In cross-pollination, the pollen is produced in the anthers of one flower and carried to the stigma of a different flower. Okay, now this is an example of self-pollination and this is an example of cross-pollination. We have the pollen grains in the anthers, okay? And remember, this is part of the male reproductive organ. So in self-pollination, the pollen is produced 
in the anthers. And it's carried to the stigma of the pistil in the same flower. But in cross-pollination, it's different. The pollen is still produced in the anthers of, okay, but the pollen is produced in the anthers of one flower and it's carried to the stigma of a different one, okay, of a different flower. So how this is done is the pollen from the stamens sticks to a bee as it visits a flower to collect food. Okay, so as the bee carries the pollen, the bee travels to another plant of the same type, and then the pollen on the bee sticks to a pistil of a flower on the other plant, and you have cross-pollination. Okay, and these are pollinators. We have various insects, butterflies, bats, ladybug, lady, ladybugs, birds. It's really beautiful, really interesting. So we're going to talk about pollination and double fertilization. So pollen, we could let pollen represent N. which is the same thing as saying haploid, okay? So pollen is deposited on the stigma of a pistil, okay? So pollen is deposited on the stigma of the pistil. The pollen germination on the stigma forms the pollen tube. So first pollen is deposited on the stigma of the pistil. This leads to the germination on the stigma forming the pollen tube. Okay, the pollen tube grows through the style and the ovary tissues and reaches one ovule, and it's still haploid at this point. One sperm nucleus will fertilize the egg nucleus in the ovule, forming the embryo, which is now diploid. The other sperm nucleus will fertilize the two polar nuclei in the ovule, to form the seed endosperm, okay? The ovule becomes the seed and the ovary becomes the fruit. So remember, always remember that the ovule becomes the seed and the ovary becomes the fruit. Ovule, seed, ovary, fruit. Ovule becomes the seed and the ovary becomes the fruit. So pollen is deposited on the stigma of the pistil. Pollen germination on the stigma forms the pollen tube. The pollen tube grows through the style and the ovary tissues and reaches one ovule. One sperm nucleus will fertilize the egg nucleus in the ovule, forming the embryo. The other sperm nucleus will fertilize the two polar nuclei in the ovule to form the seed endosperm. The ovule eventually becomes the seed and the ovary eventually becomes the fruit. Okay? And you can see a the process of double fertilization in this illustration where you can see this is the location this is the pollen grain this is the stigma this is the style this is the ovary this cell is diploid this is the egg nucleus, and this is the ovule. We then have two sperm nuclei. Pollen tube is, is formed. We, okay, we have the tube nucleus, and then we have double fertilization occurs. One sperm fertilizes the central cell, which is basically the formation of the endosperm. And one sperm fertilizes the egg cell, which is diploid. Okay, now we're going to talk about mono monocots. Okay, so this is what a monocot flower looks like under the microscope. 
Okay, this is actually the anther uh, cross section. This is what an anther looks like under the microscope. And remember, this is part of the male reproductive organ. Okay, we have the stigma in a close up. We have the stigma. We have the style. And we have the anthers. These are the petals, petals. Petals, 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 sepal. Both the petal and the sepal form the tepals. Okay. And you can see the stigma style and anthers over here. And this is a cross section of the ovary. And this is the ovary longitudinal section you can see over here. So now we're going to talk about different flower types. We have solitary flowers. We have gr uh, groups of flowers are called inflorescence. So we have sol solitary flowers. Um, groups of flowers are called inflorescence. We have the perfect flower. The perfect flower is the equivalent of saying hermaphrodite. Okay? Hermaphrodite equals a perfect flower. Same thing as saying a perfect flower. So groups of flowers are inflorescence, solitary flowers, okay? Perfect flower equals hermaphrodite. Has both anthers and carpels. The imperfect flower has either anthers or carpels, but never both. So the imperfect flower has either anthers or carpels, but never ever both. The perfect flower has both anthers and carpels, and it's called a hermaphrodite. Okay, so monoecious plants are imperfect flowers. Okay, and dioecious plants are imperfect flowers too. So in monoecious plants, when we have imperfect flowers, imperfect flowers, meaning that they have either anthers or carpels, but not both. The male flowers and the female flowers are on the same plant. Okay. The male flowers and the female flowers are on the same plant. So this, some examples of this are birch, oak, maize, Mm, cucumbers, watermelon. So, watermelon, cucumber, maize, oak, birch, where the male flowers and the female flowers are on the same plant. Watermelon, cucumber, maize, oak, birch. Now, for the dioecious plants, in terms of imperfect flowers, they equal unisexual plants. Okay, they're called unisexual plants because the male flowers are on the male plants and the female flowers are on the female plants. So some examples of this are the mulberry, the willow, and the pop poplar. Okay. Now, this is what a hermaphrodite looks like. Okay, we have a hermaphrodite, which are perfect flowers. Okay, you can see sepals. You can see the petals. The sepals. Sepals, the petals, the stamens, and the carpels. And they're perfect flowers because they have both anthers and carpels, which, which, or pistils. So they both have, the perfect flower has anthers, both anthers and carpels. Okay. And it's also called a hermaphrodite, perfect flowers. Sepals, petals, stamens, carpels. Okay. Now these are, well this is an imperfect flower. Okay, this is monoecious. 
which means unisexual flowers on the same plant and basically the female flowers and the male flowers are on the same plant okay and basically some examples of this are you know cucumbers maize oak birch watermelon uh, these are imperfect flowers too but these are um, dioecious okay examples of these are the willow the mulberry and the poplar and remember these are imperfect flowers that the flowers um, well the female flowers are on the female plants and the uh, male flowers are on the male plants okay we're almost finished Just a couple more pages. So now we're going to talk about floral symmetry. Okay, so we have actinomorphic, um, which is another name for radial symmetry. So we have actinomorphic radial, sym radial symmetry. The cor corolla has similarly shaped petals that radiate from the center of the flower and are equidistant from one another. So that's what radial symmetry and actinomorphic basically mean. So an example is the corolla has similarly shaped petals that radiate from the center of the flower and are equidistant from one another. So you can see this. This is actinomorphic floral symmetry or radial symmetry. Okay, where? They're similarly shaped petals that radiate from the center of the flower and they're all equidistant from one another. Radial symmetry and actinomorphic, okay? Now, there's also zygomorphic. So zygomorphic is what we call bilateral symmetry and the flower that has the right half should be equal to the left half. Okay, the parts in a whorl are not similarly shaped. So this is an example of zygomorphic, where the, the right and the left sides of the flower are equal to each other. And this is an example of bilateral symmetry. Okay. So we have, we're going to talk about fruits, okay, and their classifications of the fruit. So an example of simple fruits are fleshy um, and dry fruits. So fleshy fruits and dry fruits are called simple fruits, okay. An exam various examples of fleshy fruits are berries, pepo, Hesperidum, droop, and pome. Dry fruit examples are dehiscent, legume, capsule. Okay, so dehiscent in dry fruits include the legume and the capsule, and indehiscent in dry fruits include echini, nuts, grains, and samara. Okay, those are all examples of dry fruits. Simple fruits are divided into fleshy fruits, such as berries, such as pepo and hesperidum, and then we also have droop and pome. For compound fruits, they're divided into aggregate, aggregate and multiple. So aggregate is composed of many fruitlets that originate from a single flower with many separate pistils, such as a strawberry. So compound fruit example is a strawberry, which is an aggregate, which is composed of many fruitlets that originate from a single flower with many separate pistils. Okay, another compound fruit classification is multiple, which means it's composed of many fruitlets that originate from an inflorescence. Other flower parts, such as the mulberry and the pineapple. Okay, 
So what does inflorescence mean again? So inflorescence is just another term for groups of flowers. Okay. Okay, these are simple fleshy fruits. Simple fleshy fruit examples are the poem. Okay, poem, which is another name for an apple, but this is what we call it. Poem, the droop, which is a cherry, simple fleshy fruit, poem, droop. This would be called a droop. This, the tomato would be called a berry. A cucumber would be called peppo. Hesperidum, would, an orange would be called hesperidum. These are all examples of simple fleshy fruit. Poem equals apple. Droop equals um, cherry. Peach, droop. Tomato, berry. Cucumber, peppo. Hesperidum, orange. Okay, so pe the poem, by definition, is a fruit formed by a group of carpels more or less firmly united with each other and surrounded by and united to the floral tube or receptacle. Remember, examples of poems are apples, pears, and mountain ash. Okay. So they're fruit formed by a group of carpels more or less firmly united with each other and surrounded by and united to the floral tuber receptacle. Droops, okay, are fruit developed from a superior ovary in which the innermost portion of the wall, the endocarp, becomes hard and stony and the outermost part, the, part, the exocarp, becomes a relatively thin skin and the middle portion between the skin and the stone which is called mesocarp becomes either fleshy or fibrous examples of droop are peach cherries coconut walnut and hickory the berry is a fruit in which the ovary wall or at least its inner portions become enlarged and usually juicy so some examples of this are a banana, grapes, tomatoes, and gooseberry. Hesperidum examples are citrus and orange, oranges. Um, hesperidum is a special type of berry in which a rind forms. The interior of the fruit is divided by septa, indicating the number of carpels. And pepo, an example is cucumber, is fruit formed by a group of carpels more or less firmly united with each other and surrounded by an united to the floral tube or receptacle. Okay. We have simple dry fruits, such as the red bud and peas, which are legumes. We have capsules, such as poppy and jimson weed. We have acnes, which are like sunflower, dandelion. We have samaras, such as the elm and the red maple. Okay. So a legume is a dry, dehiscent fruit developed from one carpel and at maturity splitting along both the dorsal and ventral sutures. Examples of this are B. 